Hi, Jeremy. Hey, Judy. <laughs> hey, Judy. <laughs> <laughs> It's so good to be with you in this space and to be talking about planetary justice right now. Um, but let's just get a little background about how we know each other and why we're here. Um, this interview is for the intention of sharing with our communities, our classes, and um, getting a little deeper into some of the work you've done in this recent paper and a little bit of mine too. So it's kind of going to be an informal interview, but an interview nonetheless. Um, and we can introduce ourselves, but we can also, I'll start with saying that we've known each other for 20 years now, I think. Met at 22. Colorado. 22. 22 years. 22. Yeah. Yeah, we met at Colorado College when I was a student there taking philosophy classes and you were teaching philosophy classes there. Very first course. That's right. I remember it very well. Yeah. And just to- Should um, I tell them that you showed up uh, barefoot? Well, I don't even remember that. Did I? Yes, you did. <laughs> yes, in good Colorado college form. You and the other however many students there were showed up and you were my you were the barefoot student. Yeah, well, I might have so come cool. back from a hike or something, you know, on Pikes Peak. It was so cool. It was so cool. Yeah. I've never had that happen since. I wish it would happen more. Oh. Um, yeah, and uh, we worked together. That was at, uh, at Colorado College. You take one course at a time for about a month and then there's a long weekend it's like three and a half weeks and then there's like you know four four days in between four or five days in between mm -hmm. and that was a two that was a two block course because it was a history of modern philosophy right. and um i had just come from the university of chicago which um does live up to its reputation for being sometimes ridiculously rigorous mm -hmm. and i thought okay this is colorado college the students are so involved in what they do they do it class at a time and so I assigned a ridiculous amount of reading uh -huh. to that first two semesters and you were right with it the whole time and we have never stopped talking since that's right I still remember <laughs> one of the most helpful uh one of the most helpful days in that class was when you uh gave tips on how to skim read and but this was like three quarters through the class and we had just like come in super tired from a paper that was due that day and you had assigned like 500 pages of marks and you're like how come none of you have read all of this and we're like <laughs> <laughs> yes and i and i and and, I, and and it was because of you folks that i came up with the word <laughs> i think or if if not i'd done it before but it, but it was the first time i really used it and mm -hmm. instead of skimming i would say structuring mm -hmm. which is it is skimming but skimming makes it sound like, you know, especially, and this was, you know, this is 22 years ago. It still wasn't fully screen culture like it is now. Mm -hmm. I mean, nowadays, yeah. everything's so slick and fast and superficial. And there's been lots of psychology work done on that. But, um, but skimming sounded like that might not be helpful. So I said structuring. And then that's right. It was, we were reading Das Kapital, right? The first oh. volume. And, um, and so the, the idea was, how do you use the table of contents? How do you use the introductory paragraphs? How do you use the, 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 the headings mm -hmm. of the various sections? How do you read for the thesis or the point of the section? And, and basically zone out on everything else that you don't need as you're filling in the basic argument of the whole text. And, and you folks did great. I mean, mm -hmm. it's an amazing thing to realize that you could literally take, you know, at that time, all you're doing is one class but maybe so maybe you do a class for three hours a day then maybe you have three hours of homework right yeah. so you could take three hours and actually come back with something cohesive to say about you know 500 pages of marks and this is without you know nowadays it would be the internet and <laughs> you'd get an analytical guide and everything but you right. could figure it out for yourself yeah. yeah yeah very practical and i still I, I teach those skills now as a teacher myself. Oh, really? Oh, wow. Yeah, cool. yeah. And we're teaching planet, uh, climate justice this quarter, too. Yes. Um, I want to hear a little bit about your course, um, just, to, just to understand fully the context. You told me a little bit about it, but it would be interesting to frame it here for a discussion. Um, I have a, a small uh, climate justice seminar here at Case Western Reserve University, where I work. Uh, in the philosophy department. Um, and um, uh, interestingly, I think there's only one student in the course who would describe themselves roughly as a philosophy student. Um, the other students include someone who's an um, aerospace engineer. 
Um, somebody who, believe it or not, is a um, uh, a master's student uh, getting an MFA in classical guitar playing at the Cleveland Institute of Music, wants to finish up their end of their semester, their end of their time there with, uh, um, you know, some philosophy. Um, and, and you know, there's uh, some, and, and there's folks who are interested in neuroscience and, and so on. So but it's a small seminar. We meet at night. Um, we meet in my office, which is a... Uh, um, it's a decently sized office with like a sitting area. So it's, it's nice for them. They get it. We can literally sit around. We have a bunch of lamps on and, you know, you just, you, you, you we talk for two and a half hours. Um, yeah. So, and just to give a shout out to your institution, we're using a book from someone at your institution, Stephen Gardner and Arthur uh, Obst, who just got a PhD like you um, from the university of Washington. We're using their dialogues on climate justice, which just came out last year. Um, I really like the book. It's a really thoughtful book. And of course, Steve, um, you know, has done major, major things in mm -hmm. uh, climate philosophy and climate ethics. And um, so, yeah, and, you know, we're reading a bunch of other stuff, too. We're reading some, um, I actually have it right here because I'm reading it. I don't know if you can see this. This is The Cosmic Oasis mm -hmm. by uh, Zalashevich and Williams. So a paleobiologist and a geologist. But of course, Zalashevich and Williams are on the stratigraphers group to decide whether or not um, we're going to call, you know, we're going to be talking about the Anthropocene uh, officially in geological mm -hmm. circles. Mm -hmm. um, and that book, The Cosmic Oasis, came out last year. So we are trying to read some science alongside, um, you know, the philosophy and the climate justice work. We're also uh, reading Olafemi Taiwo's book, Reconsidering Reparations, mm -hmm. uh, Max Leboyon's book, uh, Pollution is Colonialism. Um, and then a short book by Dipesh Chakrabarty about um, called One Planet, Many Worlds. So it's a very interdisciplinary um, course. But uh, how about yours? It sounds like it's uh, it's in the Department of Atmospheric Sciences, right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah, that's the class that's motivating this conversation from my end. And so I, I did my graduate work first in the Department of Atmospheric Sciences at the University of Washington um, in climate science doctoral program. And then after finishing my master's, I went in the interdisciplinary direction to focus on how we relate to climate data, in particular, how we um, kind of bring emotional intelligence to regarding the data and how do certain data sets, as we're expressing them, for me, as, as expressing them as a scientist, how do we um, bring more meaning to them? So my work focuses on that um, relationship to to data as a way of relating to the earth in a, in a broad sense. And I worked with Dargan Frierson, whose text we're using for this class. He's a climate oh. scientist. And this class is very different from yours. This is a large lecture class. I think there's 187 students enrolled now. And, uh, wow. and we'll be starting in a week and a half. And um, it will be both synchronous and asynchronous. So students can join a live lecture or watch it uh, afterwards. So cool. very cool. different, very different settings here, but um, but they'll 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 interact, and that's that's great. I'm excited about that. Yeah. Are your students uh, going to hear some of your compositions? Likely, but I'm not going to center them in the class. Yeah. So. Yeah, it feels egotistical. Well, so let me give a shout out. Uh, Julia's. Um, Julia, my gosh, I'm thinking of Julia Gibson. Judy's <laughs> compositions, I'll tell you about Julia Gibson in a minute. Judy's compositions are, um, in, they're incredibly original. Um, and uh, I, I, there, are, um, there are increasingly compositions in classical music and experimental music that rely on uh, climate data or in, like kind of inspiration from, um, I guess you could say like climate imagination. But um, you know, yours is uh, your your work is really grounded in in the data sets and in the in the kind of science, and then has the ability to be um, lyrical and and, and um, I guess you could say heartfelt or soulful as a as a, in addition, which is kind of an interesting combination. So it kind of it moves between moments where it feels almost inhuman, and then moments when it feels very human, and um, it's really impressive to see your work, uh, it's uh, it, its amazing to think that you were a philosophy student and that you have such a itinerary that you've gone, you know, that Judy, you've gone through um, all these different areas of study and produced this, it's completely original 
way of thinking about doing philosophy and um, climate communication. So um, yeah, I just wanted to say that for your students. And it's also pretty cool to think that you've had your works performed at, am I right, at the Kennedy Center? The National Gallery um, of Art. National Gallery of Art. And then I know that there's people overseas who perform your work. It's like, okay, wow. <laughs> so just wanted to say that for your class. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. And I have to tell you about Julia Gibson in a minute because I made that association, but we'll, we'll get there when it comes. Okay. Well, I'd love to jump into this paper that you shared, um, The Inner Life of the Planet, Earth Systems in Moral Time. And um, I liked it for lots of reasons. We can get into that. But but I wonder if we could just start by you kind of giving us a background. You, you, you motivate it by this tension um, that you found in reading Chakrabarti um, about the a, a moral view of the planet or a, a view from nowhere. And I wonder if you could just kind of bring us into the, the motivations for writing this paper and that, that kind of tension that, um, that, mm -hmm. that gets it moving. And, okay. and why you felt um, that was problematic. Okay, so um, one, one thing, the title is Earth System Science in Moral Times. And the reason that's important is because the background of the paper, so the inner life of the planet, Earth System Science in Moral Time, the, the background of the paper is really a long, um, gosh, over a hundred year long debate. It's internal to, um, uh, frankly, European and Anglophone culture about the status of science, of modern science, in its relationship to things like morality and spirituality. In the last 30 years, um, really, especially the last 20, and very much so in the last decade, um, that debate has become intensified through attention to what is called decolonial studies. So in other words, the, the attention to the way that um, quote unquote Western or colonial, formerly colonial and sometimes still ongoing colonial epistemologies, uh, foremost among which uh, is are the epistemologies of science, how those epistemologies contribute to a view of the world that discredits ahead of time in many indigenous ways of knowing. Mm -hmm. So that's in the forefront of this paper, but the actual debate um, around modern science and how it should relate to morality goes back well before the start of the 20th century. Um, you can see many of the great existentialist writers and filmmakers in the, in the middle of the 20th century and the later part, trying to come to terms with the sense that modern science has become a, a kind of juggernaut that alienates people from their souls. And foremost in their souls are things like morality, which, you know, the word morality sounds very old fashioned to some people. It sounds very judgmental. Um, there's a lot to say about it. But if you understand by morality, forget the word moral. Just think about the qualities we're talking about. Honesty, um, real care, ability to care and get outside your ego for what matters for other people, for other beings, um, trustworthiness, uh, the ability to have some reciprocity. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, we could go on and on. Sense of justice. Mm -hmm. Those are the things that matter. And the concern was that modern science has historically been um, in some way involved in a, in, a, in a complicated worldview or world system that has a way of, of sidelining moral considerations. Now, in reality, those considerations were sidelined when science was used with imperialism. For example, in the Soviet Union, there's a long there's a long history of Russian dissidents and writers being concerned about science mm -hmm. as this alienating imperial thing. Mm -hmm. um, it it was it's it's historically had real problems when science get overly driven by capitalism. Right? Let's just think about like big pharma as mm -hmm. an example. Right? Um, and also when you think about science in its relationship to industrialization, mm -hmm. right? And so it's not just science free floating, it's science as, as, a, as a complicated part, a complicated set of practices in social systems where the social systems already have real problems of injustice, 
of um, carelessness, of short-sightedness, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So anyways, the paper is located in that tradition, but I'm focusing particularly on um, this moment where in an incredibly thoughtful humanist's work, namely Dipesh Chakrabarty's work, even this person, I mean, Dipesh Chakrabarty is um, both in his writing and I think from what I know of in person, an incredibly thoughtful, warm, uh, humane person. I mean, you know, would that more people could be like this person. And this person is in, in the broadest sense, even though he may be critical about words like humanism in his books for reasons we could get into, he's definitely someone who's advocating for a more humane, uh, intercultural, um, nuanced conversation about everything that matters as we face our planetary situation. But yet, even in and 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 and, and the, the 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 this person is um, you know incredibly erudite. I mean, incredibly well read. Reads philosophy and was a physicist by training initially. Um, you know, knows the scientists very well. Has worked mm -hmm. closely with the scientists that you know we might read. Yeah. Um, and then you know is a historian. And so, but but even in this person's work, all of a sudden there's this moment where, as a historian, he is. Um, telegraphing, mm -hmm. right, from one point to another, conveying, transferring a view that he hears among some of the scientists. Again, very thoughtful, well-meaning scientists. I mean, I hung out with Mark Williams um, a little bit last fall at a conference. I mean, he's got an amazing personal story, and he's a really, um, like, the kind of person you'd trust, you'd want to have a beer with this person, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and Mark um, Williams, and for our listeners, is Mark Williams is the paleobiologist who worked with Zalashevich. Zalashevich is, is um, quoted in Chakrabarty's work. Right. So you know, Chakrabarty quotes both of these people. Mm -hmm. So, um, anyways, the point is, is that he's telegraphing from these people, who in other respects are like look like totally solid people, mm -hmm. very trustworthy, a view that alienates the moral by way of the scientific. We can get into the details of that. So I was like, whoa. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, Let's and, unpack that a little bit, right? A view yeah. that alienates the moral in terms of the scientific, right? What, let's, let's bring that down to like kind of every day. How do, how, how do people relate to that? What does that really mean? Sure. Like for students so this without is philosophy background, right? Yeah, yeah, so this <laughs> is great. So this is then the other, source of the paper. So the, the first one is I told you there's this long tradition. It's intensified because of decolonial stuff, because of, of indigenous self-determination right now. Mm -hmm. um, then, but I find it in this debate but among very thoughtful people, and I'm surprised to see it there, but it's a place to start unpacking the issue. There's one thing in the middle, which is that as someone who's been now in environmental philosophy for almost 30 years, right? And, and, and more and more over time, as I've been drawn into the field, it's very common to hear among environmentalists um, I guess you would describe them as a kind of nihilistic view. Mm -hmm. It goes something like this. Um, well, if you just think about our situation from the standpoint of the planet or from the standpoint of of geological time, or from the standpoint of um, hopefully the next round of life after the what looks to be the mass extinction event that we're in. Yeah. Uh, you know, nothing that we're doing matters anyway. Um, nobody, the planet doesn't care about us. Um, you know, it just basically, sorry, I'm not going to drop an F-bomb, but kind of like F it. Like it, it just doesn't matter. You know, like human life is trivial. Um, we need to get over ourselves. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes it'll even slip sloppily into misanthropic views. Like, you know, human beings are just a cancer on the planet. Mm -hmm. They'll probably be better for the planet once we're gone. You know, good riddance. And, and there have literally been some like public diatribes, like in Earth First back in the 80s, there was someone called Misanthropy, is a fake name, who like did something ridiculous, like, hor like horrifyingly racist and 
Um, I actually don't want to even telegraph their view here, but it was like they basically were arguing for um, epidemics mm -hmm. in, um, in, 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 in Africa, of all places, mm -hmm. <laughs> on the grounds that, it, you know, it, good riddance to the human species as soon as it's possible. So, right. I mean, th these, are, these are sloppy connections of reasoning, but the yeah. point is, is that in the background, it's not uncommon to hear people adopt a, a very um, watered down, diffuse, confusing version of some kind of geological imagination mm -hmm. in order to act as if um, the kinds of concerns that occupy us when we are trying to be responsible are just irrelevant. Right. And so, okay. So the 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 so if I could so about, if I could re yeah. so if I could just you know say that back in my own words yeah if you're thinking yeah. about the scales of geologic time and then you're thinking about the scales of human action do you lose the meaning of human action when you're thinking about geologic time because it's just a tiny blip or or how do we retain meaning of human action yes that's one of the assumptions in these views although they're not well articulated mm -hmm. now so if we go to the if we go to the view that's telegraphed um, by Chakrabarti, the view that he's getting from Earth System Sciences. And, and by the way, I, I won't mention it here because um, I don't think it would be appropriate, but I had a rather heated discussion with a extremely well-known, um, I, I won't say much more, but extremely well-known, um, let's call them planetary thinker, about mm -hmm. a decade ago that, that prefigured what Chakrabarti is saying. Mm -hmm. um, other people are saying. So I've seen this kind of, you know, I've, and I've run into scientists who've had this view before. So basically here's the view. You, you, may, you more or less crystallize the assumption in it. Mm -hmm. The view is roughly that the concerns of human morality are irrelevant once you locate human life properly in planetary space and time. Mm -hmm. Right. So if you whether, you know, one version is just put us in as one tiny pinprick in the cosmos. The other one is put us as one just ridiculously fleeting moment in um, geological time. Mm -hmm. And in, 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 in this, the thought is, is that according to these scales of space and time, when you kind of look at it from the standpoint of these particular scientific epistemologies, um, you know, human morality is um, meaningless. I think that's the, that's why it's nihilistic. Mm -hmm. And and then so that so it's not always clear what the implications of that should be. And it's very, um, frankly, it it feels like it's a unworked through area. But mm -hmm. but but in Chakrabarty's work, the point is to try to bring us to face the awesomeness of planetary space and time. Mm -hmm. So for Chakrabarty, unlike these other views that are in the background, it, the, the whole point is to decenter us, mm -hmm. right? So if you realize that we, we have these passionate concerns for global justice, for example, using Chakrabarty's language, but mm -hmm. from the standpoint of facing the planet, which means taking in the epistemology of the planetary sciences mm -hmm. um, or earth system sciences, what you realize is that um, I mean, justice is, is, is just, it's inconsequential from those perspectives. The planet mm -hmm. could care less, so to speak. It, it can't care at all. It doesn't, it doesn't, the justice doesn't seem to matter. Mm -hmm. the, the only thing that does seem to matter is whether or not, um, for us, for example, we were to do something like render the planet uninhabitable. So that would be in the case of a nuclear, um, kind of nuclear all out destruction, or possibly in the case of runaway climate change, right? Mm -hmm. So that, that literally like Venus, like yeah. if we were to make the planet um, have a Venus like atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So, and, and in Chakrabarty's language, the thought there is just that that makes it impossible for the planet to do the amazing thing, the cosmic oasis, as Williams and Alashevich say, mm -hmm. uh, and to go on and do the thing that it's been doing. But you know, the kind of moral concerns that we have about justice just don't reach the scales of the planet. They, they literally don't apply. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the thought. Mm -hmm. um, 
And the thing that troubles me about that is that this is a very fine grained point. I mean, yes, I agree with that point, but I actually think that what that does is it shows us the utter importance of the moral perspective. So I take literally all of the conclusions of these people mm -hmm. that, 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 that human life in that sense is inconsequential unless it makes the planet uninhabitable, um, that um, e even our kind of standard concepts, our moral concepts can't really encompass the scales of planetary time and space. I mean, that literally there's no way to think, we don't have the causal structure to be able to, right. to encompass them. Right. But precisely in that inconsequentiality, I guess you could say, mm -hmm. um, actually the moral comes into view and why it's so important. Mm -hmm. So that's literally, it's a very simple point. We could talk more about that, but that's that's the, the fine point. And the I, larger picture, yeah. oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Well, that there is a there is a passage that I wanted to read that's in that's speaking just to this point here that I thought was particularly illuminating. It's on the section on internalizing the meanings of the planet. Um, on page nine, you say, on the page nine, the version that I have here, Moreover, let it so emerge that I have to contend with a mind expanding object of investigation. The entirety of our species is entangled to other species and with the manifold history of life and biochemistry in this geological moment of our planet. Further, further realizing that this entire history is but a flicker in the deep time of the planet. Nonetheless, it still matters how I relate to others and myself in community, given that contention. It still matters when facing deep time, how I relate to the immemorial vastness of geological time as someone in a community who additionally has to live with her or himself. This is that like knife edge of, okay, we're thinking about the vastness of time and all of human history is about a flicker in the vastness of this time. Do we matter or not? Does my community matter or not? Like how do I bridge these two huge um, to yep. different temporalities. And yep. um, I almost feel like your argument is, I don't know if this is a word you're comfortable with, but almost like um, using faith. It's not like there's a, a scientific justification for everything still mattering, you know? So would you say a little bit okay. more about that, you know? Yeah, no, no you, you, you picked a great passage. Um, so I would say instead of the word faith, although I could see why someone, I think faith comes in later. I actually think the key. By the way, I mean that in a kind of an, an agnostic sense as well. Right? No, no, no. I I understand. I actually do think it matters um, in in whatever sense. Actually, well, maybe not whatever sense, but quali yeah. in qualified ways, it could it could go according to various theologies or atheologies. But but um, no, I think the key word is integrity, actually. Mm -hmm. Another key uh, word is intrinsic, as in something being intrinsically valuable or intrinsically good, namely good or valuable just by doing it, not for anything else it gives you, mm -hmm. right? So like, um, there are many things like that in life. The most obvious ones are ones that we enjoy, right? Um, you know, that like it's intrinsically, it's just intrinsically good. Um, to spend time with people. There may be benefits from it. Sometimes there actually may be, um, it can get in the way of other things that you should do. So it can actually sometimes set you back. But spending good social time with people, um, many people will say, is just intrinsically valuable. While you're doing it, it's just, it, it's the meaning of life. It's good. So um, so I'm interested in, I'm in, so, but you picked a great passage. I mean, basically the point is to say at exactly the moment when the gesture from um, both the scientists and the more diffuse background culture that I've seen among environmentalists at times, when just that moment is to say, we don't matter at all, none of this matters. Mm -hmm. I flip it around and say, no, actually you're starting to realize what it is for anything to matter at all in the first place. Mm -hmm. Meaning in a way this reveals that people haven't understood motivations properly. I don't fully bring this out in the papers. This is why it's fun to talk about it. Ooh, but yeah. that's the backstory, right? So the motivation isn't to do something because of what you get out of it or, or what kind of lasting monument it is. 
Or if you want to say you're doing it for your kids, but then you just push it down the line and their kids, their kids, at some point, the human species is extinct. Mm -hmm. The motivation isn't for what you get out mm -hmm. of something. The motivation is to do something that has integrity or that is intrinsically good. Mm -hmm. when, when you move life's purposes over into that realm, everything shifts. And in particular, your relationship to death or what is called in philosophy, um, finitude. Mm -hmm. Think if that word is too wordy, think finality. Mm -hmm. The relationship to everything that is final, that involves finality, death mm -hmm. shifts. Mm -hmm. Because the idea is not about egotistically trying to hold on to what outlasts you. Mm -hmm. The idea is about doing what is right and good, mm -hmm. period. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so in that, in that passage you mentioned, what I'm tr trying to suggest is far from planetary scales of space and time, um, emptying out or divesting us of moral, um, relevance, they actually are an example of how you can understand what morality is and what moral relevance is in the first place initially. In other words, that moral relevance appears exactly when you do something precisely because it's the right thing to do because it has integrity or because it makes our time have the characteristically human shape that human time has when it when it's being um carried and conducted well namely that there is there are qualities in it moral qualities like that there's generosity in the time there's fairness in the time, that there's openness between people, that there's genuine consideration and humaneness toward anything that matters and any being that matters. Mm -hmm. All of these things emerge when we conduct our time according to how we really know it should be conducted. But there are all these kinds of pressures in our world that push us off that. I mean, the most obvious ones are basically, I think, capitalistic pressures and nationalistic pressures mm -hmm. nowadays. Um, in other countries, they might be imperial pressures. <laughs> but those pressures try to, they, they have all sorts of ways through incentive structures and coercion and through kind of mass anxiety of getting into our lives and getting us to think, well, no, no, but I, I can't really do what, I'm, what I know is the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. I can't really live in a way that's intrinsically meaningful and valuable. I don't have time to do that. Mm -hmm. I don't have the privilege or the opportunity to do that. And they even use languages. This is, it gets complicated. They even use languages like privilege that comes in through the kind of social justice literature to push us off our center and make it seem like there are all these ways that, um, that ultimately morality is some kind of balancing act between what is intrinsically right and what you get out of something. Mm -hmm. And one of the, what this paper is doing is saying, actually, geological time is remarkably clear. Mm -hmm. It's like a purifier. Mm -hmm. It shows us that if we, you really want to think about what matters, then you have to think that at the end, it's what matters, so to speak, as we look each other in the face mm -hmm. and try to have some integrity. Mm -hmm. with what we do. And then in the context of the paper, I say that if, you, if you're not just talking about your personal self, but you're thinking about us as a species, mm -hmm. right? Which I think for reasons we, we would take us far afield, we should be doing if we have a sense of humanity, yeah. which is part of a sense of justice. Um, then I think we have to look at what it would be to kind of get our own house in order as a human, as humankind. Mm -hmm. And for me in the paper, toward the end of the paper, that means first and foremost, dealing with the most obvious and blatant histories of injustice that are deforming humankind such that, you know, so to speak, if we're going to, there's used to be this phrase from hip hop in the nineties and eighties, like how, how are you going to go out like that, like that? Are you going to go out like that? Mm -hmm. Right. So if we're going to go out, that means you're going out, you're dead. If you're going to go out, are you going to go out like this or like that? Mm -hmm. And the thought is, is that this perspective shifts you into thinking, no, we need to go out like that, like with justice. Mm -hmm. So, so 
what it does is it does it, it does in the language of philosophy, it does what's called an inversion or technically a dialectical inversion. Mm -hmm. And it takes the assumptions of sh that Chakrabarty's telegraphing and it, which he's using to say like concerns about justice are over here, but the planet is thinking differently. And, and, and if you really face the planet, you kind of, you, even though concerns of justice matter, it's hard to put the two together. The planet doesn't care about justice. Mm -hmm. And it says, no, actually, if you face the planet, and you understand what morality is, even more we should care about justice. Mm -hmm. we, should, we should be getting over the things that we think are about kind of egotistically hanging on to whatever consequences we want to have in the world, and we should be getting our own house in order. Mm -hmm. And I think this opens up really wonderful questions then about the, um, the purpose and the nature of earth system science or geoscience, climate science right now. Um, with their problematic histories that you just just mentioned. Um, and there's a lot of really interesting research on that. But, you know, rather than being immoral, I think that it, it opens up to these two different beautiful purposes that science can do. One is just sort of open up the minds to wonder in, in, um, um, in, in wonder-driven science or question-driven science. And then the other is the very practical sciences. A lot of climate science research now is looking at different scenarios for stabilizing the planet, right? And those questions though are moral questions, but they're also very practical, right? And so, you know, I mean, there's nothing intrinsically wrong with burning a bit of fuel and emitting carbon dioxide, unless you're doing it on massive scales and then it's, then it's wrong, right? So there's ways in which science illuminates morality in those ways we don't, we don't know until we study it what the effects are. So um, can you talk a bit about that relationship between um, between earth system science now and the problems that we're considering in terms of you know how to live morally? These are these are intertwined. Yeah. And I mean I should say, yes. Um, I think the first thing I want to say, and I I remember I remember strongly coming to this view I'm about to share after I was talking with Mark Williams for a while. So he and I were keynote speakers at this conference in Poland in the fall. We literally shared the same panel. They tried to pair a humanist with a scientist. And it, you know, it's very obvious, especially if you read their book, the, the book, The Cosmic Oasis that I shared, that, you know, th this is, these are scientists who are really trying to um, benefit the common good. Mm -hmm. Like there's no, there's nothing indirect about it. It's quite direct. And, and I, I just want to say, I think that um, I, I, I wouldn't want to put a figure on it, but I would, I would say the overwhelming um, weight is on the side of scientists who have some disposition like that, that I've met. I mean, I'm, and I'm in a very, you know, serious science school myself. Case Western Reserve University is a really serious um, school for the sciences and engineering. Um, so the book, so the argument I'm giving is really aimed at, I don't know if it's quite as minoritarian as I'd want it to be, but I still think in the, in the, in the, if you're being generous in the big picture of things, it's the minority view, right? It pops up in weird places at times. There was a period in the 20th century where it was huge. It, science has nothing to do with morality. Don't get those two in the same room. But that was a world before me too started to revolutionize the way science is practiced in, in accelerator labs <laughs> or accelerators, I should say, you know, that was before people started to look at, you know, the racism in science, mm -hmm. right? That, that, that's 20th century, 21st century. There's been all sorts of, of, of ground clearing internal to the practice of science. And then because of the kinds of things we're facing with um, global warming, with AI and mm -hmm. so on. Mm -hmm. So, um, so it's really a minoritarian view, but what that I'm, that I'm criticizing, but I still want to do cleanup work on it mm -hmm. because what I want to do is I want to make it really clear that there is a continuity between seeking the truth and having moral integrity, mm -hmm. period. Mm -hmm. There's a continuity between trying to generate comprehensive, reliable, useful knowledge and being a member of a community where you're responsible for the common good. 
-hmm. There's a continuity that is in the head. It's in the systems. And it, and so it absolutely should be in our hearts. Mm -hmm. It's that simple. I'm not doing anything more fancy than that, mm -hmm. but it's a very, very important thing, mm -hmm. especially when there are these distorting. So I didn't, I haven't dropped this word yet. One of the background concepts of the paper is a concept called social alienation. Mm -hmm. It goes all the way back to Marx's writings, um, uh, the 1844 manuscripts, which are considered his humanist period. That's the writing that talked about what's called a strange or alienated labor. Mm -hmm. It's a very important, um, it was, they were notebooks. Um, that particular manuscript has been important for liberals, like my teacher, Martha Nussbaum, mm -hmm. as well as you know an entire tradition of leftist and socialist critical theory. Mm -hmm. And when it was kind of magnified through a person, a Hungarian named uh, Georgi Lukács, in history and class consciousness, it really took on a life of its own. The, the, Lukács was the first person to really theorize this notion of what's called reification. So I, I won't go into this, but for those people in class who are kind of into this kind of stuff, you could follow it. But social alienation is the general category. And in social alienation, you know, kind of the most classic example from Marx is that in um, really brutal kind of really brutal urban factory environments that he was analyzing in England in the 19th century, he would say eating was reduced to mere devouring. The German is even better. He says, you know, Essen, which is the German word for um, eating as a, you know, with people over dinner, socializing, becomes fressen, which is the word you use when a quote unquote wild animal, forget the speciesism for a minute, but when like a wild animal tears apart food, and Marx's mm -hmm. point was not to not to put down other species. He was, it was to say humans have a, a very distinctive way of eating. Mm -hmm. So do many other animals. We know this, of course, now more than Marx did. But humans like socialize. Mm -hmm. We have religious ceremonies. We have holidays. We, uh, we put so much effort, symbolic effort into eating. Mm -hmm. But in certain kinds of environments, for Marx, this was in capitalism, it, that stuff gets alienated. And it's like you're 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 doing something basic to human life, but you're dehumanized. Mm -hmm. That tradition has a link to the idea that you could seek truth and knowledge, and even insist that it should be divorced from morality. Mm -hmm. How screwed up is that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's alienated. Morality is not this optional thing. If the mm -hmm. word morality gets in the way, get rid of it. Morality is as basic as what you learn from anybody in your community, whoever deserved the name elder that took care of you, mm -hmm. to be a decent person, to be cared for, to learn how to care for yourself, to care for others. All those qualities mm -hmm. are morality. And without those qualities, we don't have a recognizably human life. We mm -hmm. have a dehumanized life. Well, here's a scientific tradition, even found in this wonderful humanist work and in the work of these wonderfully minded, common good oriented scientists mm -hmm. that says, well, in so many words, maybe you kind of got to get over the morality to some extent when you're thinking about the planet. And they don't literally mean abandon social justice or anything. They just mean we're going to have to live with a split mind. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to say, even there, no. Mm -hmm. But in, in just to come back to your question, when it comes to people who are using science for practical benefit, the point is just again to insist on this holistic integration of all the values that matter in our sense of humanity as not being foreign to things like truth seeking and knowledge seeking. Mm -hmm. and, and there's a whole different way to do science. I'm sure you know this better than I do, that people are working for now in feminist philosophy of science and anti-racist philosophy of science and decolonial or anti-colonial forms of science mm -hmm. that are saying, we can do science differently. You, mm -hmm. you can take species samples as you're looking for the kinds of plastic that get ingested by fish. This is an example from Max Le Boyon, who's a Mischief um, scholar. And you, can, you can, and you can still take a moment and think about the creature that you're dissecting. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a very simple example in lab protocol, but why should we act when we're in a lab like it doesn't matter 
that we have a relationship to this creature of responsibility. Right. It doesn't hurt anything. So that's the spirit of the paper. It's very simple, but it's just to underline that people who are serious about science should absolutely insist on a continuity of values. Mm -hmm. Against the 20th century view that goes back into, it goes back literally into the enlightenment, moments of the enlightenment, mm -hmm. um, that says that kind of science is over here and morality is over here. Mm -hmm. Well, and I wonder, I wanna kind of connect this now to thinking about the ways in which the sciences and the environmental humanities approach um, teaching global warming, climate change, climate justice. I and mean, I remember when I first started teaching global warming in the sciences, you know, we started with the greenhouse effect and understanding the role of carbon in the atmosphere, but it wasn't, there was, there was an ahistorical perspective. And um, I mean, not, not completely ahistorical, but it was very much focused on the, on the physics of the atmosphere and the role of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And you're, you're motivating a much more historical moral time perspective on global warming. And 1492 mm -hmm. comes up really importantly at the end, and I wanna make sure we have some time to talk about that, right? Mm -hmm. So if you approach global warming from a moral time perspective, what do you get? How does that shift from the, mm -hmm. the standard scientific approach, which is to think about the physics of the atmosphere first, right? Mm -hmm. This is a huge topic. Um, so, you know, direct me as we go into this. And okay. I, I, um, I'm sensitive to how complex and you could do a whole course on this. Yeah. Um, the simplest idea, I'm trying to keep it simple, um, yeah. just in the interest of time. Um, the simplest idea is to insist, you, you, you started off the paper correctly, arguing that the paper is arguing against a quote unquote view from nowhere epistemology. Mm -hmm. um, those of you who are interested, you could Google the term view from nowhere and you'll find out it has a lineage in philosophy. Um, but it's basically an idea that that there are there are recurring in recurring ways within the history of philosophy and within the history of science, there's a fantasy of wanting to achieve a kind of God's eye perspective, but get rid of God. There's no theology to it. As if there's there's, it's not a human perspective. It's a somehow perspective above everything that sees everything um, kind of radically decontextualized and takes it all in. Um, there's a lot of writing about why this fantasy would have developed in the culture that it has. <laughs> we won't go into that. But I want to, I mean, a, a simple way to put what I'm trying to do is to, is to say, no, it's a, we have to be resolutely contextual. Right, we are doing science from a particular location, a time and a place, in a particular tradition, and not only is it an not only is it not an obstruction to science to own that, it absolutely clarifies the contingencies that are involved in how you do science. By contingencies, that's a big fancy abstract word, but it can mean anything from the weird particular funding lineages you had to go through in order to get your project, the, its relationship to um, different kinds of institutions, for example, like if it's related to the Department of Defense, <laughs> um, it's the, the kind of practices and languages it uses as it learns from well-worn practices of science that were found in another domain, but that's trying to analogically push into a new domain, um, to the social practices that are part of it, right? Why there happen to be, you know, historically, so many of a certain kind of, um, frankly, white dude in these practices with a certain kind of culture. Why is that culture there? If you own the location, you, you're able to see these things more clearly. And actually not to make a huge devil out of them, but just to say, like, this is where we're doing science. This is why we're doing science. And so, you know, let's be responsible for this in its own limits as they come up. So, um, so I mean, so that's the first thing. The second thing to say is that, is that once you go, go back to the earlier point I made, once you accept 
that, so to speak, the whole person is doing science. Not just the, let's say, decontextualized scientific mind. This mind that's able to imagine itself like separating out from the moral. But once the whole person is doing science, then that whole person is in a history and that whole person is responsible to its community. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's where 1492 comes in, um, most simply. Um, we are dealing with the effects of a global regime of governance that includes what the sociologist Robert Jackal called organized irresponsibility. Mm -hmm. And actually, Steve Gardner at your university has done an amazing amount of work clarifying part of this irresponsibility, parts of this irresponsibility, right? Mm -hmm. So we exist in an international order that A, uses the nation state and its territorial exclusion of other nation states, its forms of national sovereignty as the basis for governance, mm -hmm. the basic unit, so that any agreement is international. Mm -hmm. And then you have to deal with areas that are not national and are unregulated, the global commons. Mm -hmm. This order, as Gardner has, among others, have analyzed, is extremely fragmented. And we're having such a hard time coming to terms with what is obviously a huge problem. I mean, just for for us and then grandkids, mm -hmm. let alone a thousand years from now, mm -hmm. because of this fragmented order. Mm -hmm. We have inherited this order that is not fit for the problems we're in, mm -hmm. we're facing. Okay. There's lots more to say about it, but I'll just use the nation state system. That nation state system and its model of governance is specifically and directly linked to a specific period of, we would now call it European thinking. Mm -hmm. That wasn't necessarily the word used then about this planet. And that was the, the form of thinking that emerged under European imperialism at the dawn of capitalism as the major empires were colonizing the globe. And they started by mapping something that they called a globe. Mm -hmm. yeah. The first globes, like the ostrich shell globe. Yeah. And they mapped it and they mapped it for the sake of empire to yeah. control the globe. And I mean, this we'd have to do a lot more to unpack this again, a whole course, but you can show how that epistemology of the globe is completely bound up with a set of imperial and colonial assumptions that then the international system and capital, global capitalism have basically absorbed and transmogrified in complicated ways. Mm -hmm. And what do those, what are some of the things those assumptions do? Well, they don't allow us to think responsibly about the planet. I mean, I'll just put it simply. Mm -hmm. So the for, the other part of 1492 is it's a simple way to mark that the, the situation we're in is literally linked back to this age of, quote unquote, exploration, the beginning of the age of the globe, yeah. which, of course, was also the beginning of a modern age of genocide, imperialism and slavery. Mm -hmm. And that particular age contained within it the seeds of the what we call presentism, short-sightedness, the seeds of what we call the land abstraction, in other words, thinking about territory divorced from ecology, mm -hmm. and the seeds of the cycles of domination and abuse that we're still facing as we try to come to terms as a responsible collective with the biochemistry um, that is changing on this planet as a result of, of, of um, you know, human yeah. industrialization. And so I that's why that's up, there as well. I want to bring up your reference to Christina Sharp's work in In the Wake, too, in that mm -hmm. really important term, living in the wake. Mm -hmm. And and um, wondering, I don't think I have a specific quote from that, but um, yeah, can you can you say more about how sure. that? Yeah, I'll say about it. Yeah. Yeah, and, and actually, that was interesting. That was a. Christina Sharp's book, In the Wake, on Blackness and Being, um, it affected me um, viscerally, as I believe Sharp wants people to be affected, 
mm-hmm. and the mood of it was with me as I wrote this paper. Mm-hmm. So it's a, it's a little bit harder to hear now than in the first draft. I had to kind of tighten the paper up based on reviewer comments. Mm-hmm. But in the first draft of the paper, it had this meandering quality that literally in my mind was my way of being in the wake. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyways, Sharp, um, I'll just say it really briefly. It's a 2016 book. It's a very influential book for some areas of the environmental humanities and in some areas of black studies and some areas of, I guess you could call it decolonial studies. Yeah. Um, she basically, she took the, the, liter- the figure of the slave ship in the middle passage. What's above deck, what's below deck in the hold, what it is for it to have disembarked or sorry, embarked from Africa, then disembarked in the colonies. For her, also thinking a lot of the Caribbean, um, but also of the United States. And she took the figure, and then she she had this she she was focused on the figure of the wake behind the boat. And um, it, this is I mean this is I don't want to just say this stuff kind of like quickly, but. You know, there was, there were horrendous things that happened in the wake of the boat. Um, you know, slaves were thrown overboard mm-hmm. um, for a number of quote unquote reasons. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, you can read about it. Mm-hmm. Sharp wants us to think about how, even though officially slavery is outlawed, is over, that the afterlife of slavery Mm -hmm. is still with so many people. And she's arguing, say, from this continent, right, from from quote unquote North America. Mm -hmm. And um and so she she through a number of really beautiful essays, they're basically essays in cultural studies, um, that bring together like reading of art, reading of literature, reading of the news sociological data. It's a very kind of complicated book. It also has photographs in it. She basically tries to evoke this perspective of still being pulled along by the slave ship, even though the slave ship now is a phantom ship. It's a ghost. Mm -hmm. And you're pulled along by the momentum of this, these crimes against humanity Mm -hmm. and these genocidal crimes. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it's a, it, 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 I, I won't say much more. I mean, it either works for if you, or it doesn't after you get, if you read it for a while. But I, I thought that it was, um, there were a number of things there, the feeling of being at sea, the, the, the terror of being abandoned to the open water. There were sharks that followed the wake because they, they thought that there would be, um, you know, they would eat humans who were thrown mm-hmm. overboard. And um, just a lot of it, I think captured some of the real unease that one might feel as one is pulled along by the inexorable, what seem to be forces, they don't seem to be under our control even, Mm -hmm. of this juggernaut of a capitalist, industrial, international, still imperial global economy Mm -hmm. that is... um, I mean, it's it's committing it's committing and permitting so many injustices in various ways, and it is lining up so many more for the future. Mm-hmm. So I felt that it was an important, soulful way to exist in time, um, as we think about what it what it is for us in the short time of our lives, even if it is 80, 90 years, if we're so fortunate, but still, mm-hmm. it's a short time to think about putting in the work of our lives so that we have a little bit more integrity as humankind or as our little part of humankind when we leave. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. yeah, that's really beautiful. And, you know, I'll, I'll say now when I read that last passage and you were getting into Sharp's work, I also had this, um, this longing to kind of reconnect with some grief work um, 
that it yes. just evoked for me. I have done some grief work in the past and learning sort of how important that is and thinking about planetary justice and also about, you know, my own position in the history of colonialism and yeah. settler land grabs in particular. And just like, I just had this visceral, like, oh, I really want to do this grief work more, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's so important. Yeah. Thank you. And it's so it's like connected to like what you talked about at the beginning of soulfulness. Like morality isn't just practical action, right? Um mm -hmm. so thank you for that. And yeah, and we should bring this to a close for um yeah. But also, you know, what else what else are you thinking, feeling to say right now? Yeah. No, just really briefly, thank you for bringing the back up. This is the link to Julia Gibson um, okay. that I associated with earlier. So Julia is a scholar. Um, maybe um, I would recommend for folks to read. They um, teach at Antioch, New England, and Julia works on climate justice for the dead and dying. Um, mm -hmm. But And Julia thinks in a multi-species or interspecies way. So Julia is also thinking about non-human beings or more than human beings that are uh, extinct or dead and dying as a result of climate change. Um, they have a really amazing article on this published called, I think it's called Climate Justice for the Dead and Dying. Um, but yes, and, and Julia's a student of um, Kyle White, um, the po great Potawatomi scholar at University of Michigan who's on the um, President's Environmental Justice um, panel. And, you know, in, in, in the tradition that Julia's in, the tradition Kyle's in, um, you know, getting our relationship right is really the beginning of 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 the work mm -hmm. right and and actually i'm so glad you brought this up that's really what this paper is in the spirit of it's from my tradition which is i guess you could say slovak um and a tradition of parents that really care about trying to be you know you should do the right thing mm -hmm. but um but it's still the same idea like it's you know you want to do science well you want to you want to be Part of this life well given that we have a short life get the relationship right mm -hmm. and so part of that relationship is just to go back to the sharp i even just want to emphasize this again it's like we exist in in the midst we is there different there's different people here so i can't speak for all the different there's the we has great variety i can't speak for other people but but i'll say we in the sense that you know anyone alive on earth right now exists in a situation that has been affected by the kinds of compound injustices that we've been talking about for the last you know, almost hour. Mm -hmm. And um, part of getting our relationship right from whatever position we're in, and it'll be different ways depending on our different positions, has to begin with acknowledging that. Mm -hmm. And so some of that acknowledgement will involve grief work. Some of it will involve, you mentioned faith earlier, It'll um, if we had another conversation, we could talk about how the word faith was wonderfully articulated by um, the existentialist Kierkegaard is something called repetition, the, the, the kind of um, leap into believing in goodness. Mm -hmm. um, not believing in God, believing in goodness mm -hmm. and, and in the creative possibility of goodness, even when you don't know how it's going to work out. Mm -hmm. um, but so sometimes it's grief, sometimes it's repetition, mm -hmm. but it, you know, we got to get our relationships right. And the whole thing about moral time is about, you know, bringing people back to that perspective. So, thank you so much for letting me talk about this. I learned something about the paper by talking about this. Um, so thank you, Judy. It was really, really interesting. And I you hope your so, class goes really well. Yeah, you are so welcome, Jeremy. It was my pleasure too. And uh, we'll keep talking. Okay. Take care. Bye, everyone. Okay.